Hello everyone, welcome to the Kines 293 lecture. Today we're going to continue on with our discussion of science and power and turn our attention to the ways in which it has shaped our understandings of race and the role of sport in reproducing some of these understandings of race. And specifically, we're going to try to analyze the myth of the natural black athlete. And this is something that, while it certainly has a long history, it's still something that very much persists today, as a lot of people do believe that for some reason who we consider black um, seems to be more athletic or better at sports. It's something that, well, maybe it's not talked about in the open, people grow up for some reason believing. And so today we're going to look at some of the roots of that myth. And I want to start with this video. Sports Debate Show. No, you shut up. Please welcome Harry Peters. Thank you. Oh, well, now, Harry, you know, from your point of view, what's the biggest on-field battle that we're going to see in the Super Bowl? The obvious answer is Tom Brady versus Richard Sherman. It's a classic battle of styles. Brady, the hardest-working, most intelligent player in the game. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. Sherman. Here's a guy who's got to be one of the most physically gifted creatures to ever grace the sport. Okay, 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 point taken. But Richard Sherman, is, uh, he's, he's also a hard worker, yeah, wouldn't you say? He's a smart guy. Yeah, yeah. He, he graduated Stanford. Oh, yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. He is very articulate. But for the real battle, the real football aficionado is going to have to look to the line of scrimmage. New England nose tackle Vince Wilfrick, a true freak of nature, is going to have his hands full with Seattle center Max Unger, one of the most keenly analytical minds in the league. Unger. Keenly analytical. You know, Harry, I'm sorry. Do you notice any <laughs> tendencies that you may have when um, you're describing uh, certain, I don't want to say, types of players? I don't follow. I mean, I call them like I see them. Okay, okay. You know, you know what, Harry? How about, how about this? How about this? How about we name some players? And when we say their names, you throw out the first adjective that comes to mind. Yes. Okay? I am game. Yes. All right. Julian Edelman. Industrious. Marshawn Lynch. Specimen. Stephen Hauschka, stick to itiveness. Cam Chancellor, miracle baby. Luke Wilson, cerebral. LeGarrett Blunt, voodoo. Rob Ninkovich, a tactical mastermind. What? Darrell Revis, magical powers he learned from his grandma. Come on, Harry, what? I can't even. I this calls him like I see him. Okay, I got one. Russell Wilson, hybrid. Hybrid. He, he said hybrid. He said hybrid. He said hybrid. He did say hybrid, though. That's right. Brains, gifts, hybrid. Okay, you know what? All right, so there we see kind of a surreal parody um, of some of the coded language that even today still is kind of used to describe um, white athletes and black athletes. And they very much have roots in racial ideologies that have persisted from. Um, the beginning of when race was invented during the Enlightenment. And that's what we're going to investigate today. And specifically, we're going to ask, what was the role of science in creating and perpetuating these racial myths? And then later, we're going to think about um, some of the impacts of these myths throughout history and even enduring to the current moment. And so I want to re-up um, the things that we talked about at the start of last lecture I'm kind of the theoretical base regarding science. So as we discussed, um, there's this belief that science, specifically social science, um, is this objective thing that as soon as um, we do it the right way through the scientific method, we generate a truth about the world that is incontrovertible. However, we took the opposite view, um, stating that Science has historically been deeply embedded within power relations, um, dominant discourses, and dominant ideologies. And the fact that it's seen as objective kind of obscures the socially constructed nature of a lot of the assumptions that we have. And we looked at um, the paradigm of positivism and some of its elements, right, that works when it comes to natural sciences, but is flawed when applied to social sciences. The idea that the researcher can be objective about studying people, that a universal truth exists um, when studying people and societies, that you can 
incontrovertibly prove or disprove the hypotheses that you have. You can remove your biases and you can explain everything through numbers and statistics and things like that. And we said it works in hard sciences, but when it comes to studying people and history and societies, it's a little bit more complicated. And it often doesn't have the language to consider social context and the influence of power. So instead, we talked about when it comes to studying people, that we're going to take the approach that instead of um, truths being objective, rather a lot of the truths that people come up with are highly subjective and socially constructed rather than necessary and essential. There's no universal truth. Um, nobody could ever be objective when it comes to studying the society in which they live and have their life structured in. And instead of trying to explain and predict human um, movement and, and human belief and patterns, it's easier to try to understand them. And then we move to talking about identity as an example of something that is a social construction. We talked about gender in the last lecture, and what we're going to do today is talk about race. And oftentimes we think that race is essential, that you are born black, you are born white, whatever. And that based on your race, you have certain characteristics that are truths about you. However, that's not necessarily true. Race, as we understand it today, is a relatively new concept in the course of human history. And it's not so much something that you are, it's rather something that you're classified as. So through your phenotypical factors, mostly skin color, um, but also some things such as head shape and hair texture and, and some of these other signifiers that we think about of race, these are just things that were used um, for classifications among the millions of human variations among us. So let's dig a little deeper into this argument. Modern archaeological data posits that all of humanity began in Africa um, and then slowly spread to other parts of the world and then made biological adaptations to their climate and environment based on where they were located. And so for Africans, people living near the median, um, black skin was more beneficial in the sun and the heat, whereas white skin helped to retain the heat in the colder regions of northern Europe and Scandinavia. So that's where we get these adaptations of skin color. However, from these, these surface characteristics, our idea of race today is that these characteristics are linked to these deeper truths, specifically um, one's capacity for physical, mental, social, intellectual, and uh, moral capacities. And so over millennia, um, where human groups based on their location in the world developed all these different adaptations to their environment, we chose skin color and a few other ones, but mostly skin color for the sake of the argument here, um, as the variation among humans that we give transcendent meaning to. Skin color was the adaptation that white Europeans arbitrarily chose to posit as determinative of social, intellectual, moral characteristics, right? I mean, it's just one of many variations that humans have. We could have chose height to categorize people. We could have chose body width, eye color, hair color, voice depth, any of the millions of biological differences that humans have. But we gave meaning to skin color and organized people in that way. And this truth about race that humans one day just arbitrarily decided has endured to this day and shaped the experiences of many people of different skin colors. The idea of race assumes that simple external differences rooted in biology are linked to other more complex internal differences like athletic ability 
musical aptitude, intelligence. This belief is based on the idea that race is biologically real. All of our genetics now is telling us that that's not the case. We can't find any genetic markers that are in everybody of a particular race and in nobody of some other race. We can't find any genetic markers that define race. And actually, in our way, your section. We can see differences among populations, but can populations be bundled into what we call races? How many races would there be? Five? Fifty-five? Who decides? And how different would they really be from one another? The measured amount of genetic variation in the human population is extremely small. And that's something that, that people need to wrap themselves around, that genetically we really aren't very different. In fact, genetically, we are among the most similar of all species. Only one out of every thousand nucleotides that make up our genetic code is different, one individual from another. These look-alike penguins have twice the amount of genetic difference, one from the other, than humans. And these fruit flies? Ten times more difference. Any two fruit flies may be as different genetically from each other as a human is from a chimpanzee. So it seems obvious to say, though people still misunderstand it, but science has yet to find a link between skin color and anything deeper than the surface. And even more to the point, it's failed to find any significant biological advantages or disadvantages morally, um, intellectually, socially, based on these superficial phenotypical factors that we assign as races. Therefore, race as we understand it does not exist. It's a social construction. Yes, skin color exists, but the meaning that we attach to it is completely arbitrary and culturally contingent. And we know this because just like gender, race has completely different definitions based on time and place. For example, my mother is the American definition of white, whereas my father is the American definition of black. So in the United States, I am legally black based upon the one drop rule that says that if anyone has even one drop of black blood in their ancestry, they are considered black. And in the days of slavery, that meant that they were eligible to become a slave. So I'm 50% white, 50% black. Um, but in the United States, I'm legally black, although some people... Today, the more common word is mixed or biracial. However, today in Brazil and in parts of the Caribbean, I would be called a mulatto um, because a lot of parts have more than a black-white binary. They have um, a lot of different words to describe people of various skin colors. Um, and they don't attach the meaning um, that America does. They do attach some meaning, but that's complicated and beyond the scope of this, um, but not to the extent that America does. In other parts of the Caribbean, I would be called pardo or mestizo. In parts of Africa, where ethnicity is more of the meaningful construct, I would be called colored, which has a completely different context than colored in American history. Colored in Africa would just mean that I'm mixed with white. And so, as we can see, based on, even today, Based on where I am in the world, people have a completely different meaning that they attach to me based on looking at, at my skin color. And in many parts of the world, skin color they understand um, as not to be meaningful at all, as a means of categorization. 
And so despite these meanings being completely made up in their origin and fluid throughout their development, it's not enough for us to say that race, as we understand it, does not exist. Because it does exist, socially, in how it has prompted human actions based upon these misunderstandings. So while race isn't biological, it most certainly is social. And one example of this is social Darwinism. And this is something that we're going to talk about later in the course. Um, but basically, it's an example of science extrapolating um, these paradigms and, and methods that are used in the natural sciences of biology, in this case, um, evolutionary theory and Darwinism, and trying to apply it to social sciences and people. And so when Darwin dropped his origin of species, basically saying, basically introducing the concept of evolution and survival of the fittest, things like that, people tried to apply it to cultural development and societies. And they looked at um, societies in Europe and North America and Africa and said the ones that are thriving must be the ones that are best, that are the fittest, whereas the ones that are not thriving or the ones that have died off must be the ones that um, evolutionary is, evolution is just picking off. And it said that people are natural products of their biology. So cultures that are doing bad are biologically preordained to do bad. Cultures that are doing good are biologically preordained to do good. However, this ignores, like I said, a lot of context and complexity. It ignores the entire history of colonialism, of slavery, of war, of genocide, um, of all these different things things throughout of history that are more explanatory in understanding why cultures are at a certain stage of development um, in comparison with other cultures. It was more of a justification that of course was advanced by white people who saw themselves as the fittest than it was an explanation that had real power in understanding the world. Turn the clock back 400 years, which is when the concept of race was invented or created. It was created rather as a justification for exploitation, oppression, slavery. It then became kind of embedded in the consciousness and handed down through the generation so that it became part of our language, the way that we refer to groups of people, races of people. And it's one of these things that stuck. <laughs> Black people as slaves were little more than chattel, listed along with horses and farm animals as the white master's property. Racial differences were looked at afresh by scientists once Charles Darwin's theory of evolution began to revolutionize scientific thinking. Many concluded that like other species of animal, races of humans were also products of evolution. Whites as higher beings and blacks as primitive entered the popular lexicon. Social prejudice as science. Pioneering race scientists like Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton, applied the idea of natural selection to the human race. A hundred years ago, in this laboratory here in London, the Galton Laboratory as it's called, there was a universal belief that black people and white people were as different as dogs and cats. They were just totally distinct units. And I don't, your listeners, your viewers don't need reminding that that was used in the most disgraceful way to discriminate against particular human groups. The ideas of 19th century race scientist Count Arthur de Gobineau were borrowed to legitimize the Nazi mythology of Aryan superiority over lesser humans like Jews and blacks. And so obviously this idea of social Darwinism had devastating and reprehensible consequences for those that were cast at the bottom of this Darwinist theory of human development. And it coalesced in the practice of eugenics, which really started in the United States in the early 1900s and was then adopted by um, Nazi Germany and, and kind of came to its head in... 
um, the Holocaust. But essentially, following the logic of social Darwinism, it said that if some cultures are the fittest and therefore are, are biologically preordained um, to continue and develop at higher rates, whereas some are biologically preordained to die off, why don't we speed up the process? Why don't we um, allow the, the best fitted cultures and ethnicities and quote unquote races to breed and prohibit the non-fittest ones from breeding? And so this is what the eugenics movement was, essentially an argument that those with positive traits, meaning white, meaning European or American, should be allowed to reproduce, and other people with negative traits, such as those with disabilities, mental health issues, and people who weren't white, and, and specifically black, um, would be sterilized. And they wouldn't be able to reproduce. Since the thinking was, since they're biologically going to die off anyway, since they're not the fittest, I mean, look at Africa, then we should just speed up the process was the disgusting implication of this idea. Racial purification was one aim of the eugenics movement. The science of eugenics rested on simple Mendelian genetics. One gene each from father and mother, it was believed, gave rise to any trait, physical, behavioral, even moral. Some of these things were things like the ability to play chess, rowdiness, congenital feeble-mindedness, um, uh, virtually any cultural or behavioral trait you could imagine. Now, the mistake that they were making was assuming that complex behaviors could be reduced to simple Mendelian genes. Nonetheless, eugenicists use the science of the day to advance a social agenda widely accepted in white America breed the best and the brightest, always white, and breed out society's worst and weakest, of all colors. There's a lot of concern about race mixing. You don't want a superior race, a race with great qualities of intellect and achievement and musical genius and these kinds of things to mix with a race on a lower stage of civilization that has fewer of these characteristics because that again would bring down the level of those characteristics and what you want to have for your civilization. To keep America's mongrels at bay, eugenicists proposed a series of restrictive measures unthinkable today. Yet they were adopted within and outside of America. Taken to their extreme, they fueled one of the century's greatest horrors. The Nazi propaganda machine pointed out that their eugenic policies were entirely consistent and in fact derived from ideas of American race scientists. So as we can see, this this need to scientifically assign people races arbitrarily had devastating consequences. And I should point out that um, the reason that people of different races, as we understand them, have different development is not because of their biology or their predestination um, or the fact that they are the fittest or not the fittest. It's based on human treatment based on that lie. So what's more explanatory in um, understanding differential development um, are the things based on um, human treatment. So the stolen generations in North America and Australia, where people took indigenous white people and, and colonizers took indigenous people and tried to um, whiteify them, assimilate them through breeding um, and totally get rid of the culture, of course, slavery, apartheid, and Jim Crow that legally did not allow black people to develop um, equally with white people, genocide of Native Americans, genocide of um, groups all throughout the globe, including Jews and, and Roma and homosexuals, all these different things that are really the source of the differential development. Um, 
are kind of applied through the circular logic that it's okay to do that because they're going to be slow to develop anyways. It's a vicious circle of um, pseudoscience and lies and um, intentional misunderstanding and it's had terrible impacts throughout our history. So let's move in real quick to how race was invented and then we'll talk about um, how it's manifested in sport. And so although the concept of a default in, a, in an other um, oops, although that existed kind of before the Enlightenment um, the late 17th century is kind of the era we look to as when race, as we understand it today, um, was first invented. And it starts with the Enlightenment, in which we get our um, people start to modernize their thought, and instead of relying on tradition, they try to use um, the newly found scientific method to derive these truths about first natural sciences and then later social sciences. And while they all said in lip surface that all people um, were equal, they also created these categories um, that they thought were based on these biological variations that had a hierarchy. They created these taxonomies of race. So in 1779, Johann Blumenbach identified five races, um, Caucasian, Mongolian, Malayan, Ethiopian, and American. We can all extrapolate what those were. And a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers didn't consider any of the race, any races to be naturally inferior, although a lot of people, um, a lot of the common folks did, a lot of the thinkers did not. However, by the 19th century, when you differentiate people, that's what inevitably happens. There was this idea that some of the races, based on the fact that they look different, must have different moral intellectual characteristics. And therefore, we get the creation of this hierarchization that had Caucasians at the top, who of course were creating these taxonomies, and um, Africans and, and um, diasporic Africans at the bottom. At the turn of the 20th century, American society was riding a wave of confidence as an emerging industrial power. And the face of its power and prosperity was white. African Americans lived under the yoke of Jim Crow segregation. Most surviving Native Americans had been banished to reservations. And new immigrants crowded into urban ghettos. Disease was rampant. Death rates soared. Infant mortality was high. To many, this reflected a preordained natural order. Those that looked wanted to confirm what they saw, which is to say that the proper place of, say, the Negro, or in other regions of the country, the Native American, or the Chinese, we're at the bottom of the, the social and political hierarchy. And if you can say that they are fundamentally biologically different, then they should be. Then it's natural for them to be at the bottom of our social hierarchy. The biology becomes an excuse for social differences. The social differences become naturalized in biology. It's not that our institutions cause differences in infant mortality. It's that there really are biological differences between the races. And so we see science as flawed in creating these understandings of race. Um, but let's talk about how it went even further. And a large thing that we need to talk about before getting to sport is scientific racism. And this is what the Miller article talked about. Whereas science then turned to um, trying to find the specific mechanisms, the specific biological variations that were responsible for the inferiority of non-white races. Because they assumed it to be there, um, they had this hypothesis that it was there, and so they tried to test different things about non-white bodies 
in order to try to find the link to understand it. And this was the practice of anthropometry, which was measuring different body parts, as the Miller article talks about, um, to try to find the source of inferiority and later physical superiority, as people thought. Um, IQ tests were also used to measure intelligence, which, as we know now, um, are basically useless, and that the idea of intelligence itself doesn't mean anything, as there are a lot of different intelligences. And they also used statistical analysis that, of course, didn't have the explanatory power to consider context and power in order to differentiate between groups. For 200 years, scientists poked and prodded, measured and mapped the human body, searching for a biological basis to race. Some measured facial angle to illustrate the proximity of races to the primitive. Others calibrated skull size to identify those with superior or inferior intelligence. Measures of eye shape, hair form, even brain color were scrutinized in the hunt for the fundamental sources of racial difference. If we just take African Americans as an example, there's not a single body part that hasn't been subjected to this kind of analysis. You'll find articles in the medical literature about the Negro ear and the Negro nose and the Negro leg and the Negro heart and the Negro eye and the Negro foot, and it's every single body part. And they're constantly looking for some organ that might be so fundamentally different in size and character that you can say this is something specific to the Negro versus whites and other groups. Scientists are part of their social context. Their ideas about what race is are not simply scientific ones, are not simply driven by the data that they are working with. That is also informed by the societies in which they live. For Prudential Life Insurance statistician Frederick Hoffman, those differences could lead to only one fate for African Americans. In Vital Capacity, he wrote, the tendency of the Negro race has been downward. This tendency must lead to a still greater mortality and in the end cause the extinction of the race. Hoffman's Race Traits and Tendencies of the American Negro was published in 1896, the same year the Supreme Court legalized segregation. It was one of the most influential publications of its day. What's interesting is that it resonated in the minds of so many other social observers of the time, the extinction thesis. It, it fit into their notions of how uh, races become ascendant in the world, they looked at other groups of people in various stages beneath them as approaching the completely civilized state. Hoffman presented his statistical data as unimpeachable science. He compared rates of death and disease between African Americans and whites, and, not surprisingly, found enormous disparities. But his data analysis was flawed. He ignored the insidious effects of poverty and social neglect on health. In contrast to today's belief in black physical superiority, Hoffman concluded that African Americans were innately infirm. As such, attempts to improve their housing, health and education would be futile. Their extinction was inevitable, encoded in their blood. And so, despite this obsessive search for the source of racial difference that existed for centuries, they couldn't find anything, to, and to this day could not find anything. Because race is a social construction, it's not biological. 
And so by not considering social context, they couldn't find the reason for these differential rates in almost every metric, um, mortality, health, education, poverty, things of this sort. And so they never came to the conclusion, though, as many people, but not enough people today have, that it's not race as the determinant in these differentials. It's racism that's the determinant, meaning that it's historical treatment, cultural treatment, institutional barriers to certain things. And sport was an important mechanism in kind of um, symbolically reproducing this I ideology of race for both white people and black people. We know throughout the 1800s, um, black people at first were slaves, and then once they were free, um, were of course segregated and not allowed to play in a lot of the sporting institutions. But there were various opportunities in which white people and black people could compete against each other. And so while black people were barred from um, equal treatment and equal education and even literacy, things like that, sport was one of the few areas in which there was kind of, sort of, a level playing field where it was just one-on-one. -on -one. And boxing was one of um, the sports in which this was true. And so throughout the 1800s, racial ideology stipulated that whites were both physically and mentally superior to blacks. And boxing was one of the arenas through which this symbolism reproduced. And a lot of white males allowed African Americans in the ring because it was a chance to demonstrate their superiority. And as we already talked about, um, Jack Johnson um, was somebody that arose from this tradition. A lot of white heavyweight champs would avoid black challengers because um, they didn't even want to face the reality that they might lose and that in their guts they knew that um, the idea that they're superior isn't complete fact. And so we get the great white hope um, in Jeffries. This quote again, can the huge white man Jeffries beat down the wonderful black and restore the Caucasians, the crown of elemental great, elemental greatness, as measured by the strength of blow, power of heart and being, and with all the cunning of keenness that denotes mental as well as physical superiority. A call for someone to finally beat that African American Jack Johnson and restore all the racial ideas that people have. And as we discussed, Johnson beat Jim Jeffries and became the heavyweight champ. And there were race riots and um, America kind of went into upheaval. But something else significant happened. It kind of um, upended racial ideology as well. There was a reassessment of racial science after this that basically stated that, um, okay, well, if black people are starting to beat white people in sports, how does this make sense? How does this um, jive with our understanding of race? And so they came to this new configuration. It was this idea that maybe African Americans are actually physically superior to whites, but whites were intellectually and morally superior. And this made sense to a lot of people because it justified slavery in a new way. It said that if blacks are physically superior then we were just doing what nature um, designated with slavery. We were letting blacks use their bodies, which they were preordained to do. If they were physically superior, it was just efficient that black people would be the labor and white people would be the brains. And it also said that there's no reason for them to need education or them to need equal rights, because after all, they're physically superior, but intellectually, morally, socially, they'll never be able to compete in civil society with whites. And this ideology, um, the idea of black physical superiority, has endured to this day. He's bred to be the better athlete because this goes back all the way to the Civil War, when during the slave trading, the big 
the owner, the slave owner, would 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 breed his big black to his big woman. Jimmy the Greek Snyder was fired by CBS from its NFL pregame show. Al Campanis' lifelong association with the Dodgers ended after this infamous interview. They may not have some of the uh, necessities to uh, be, uh, let's say, a field manager. Howard Cosell was criticized for this remark. And that little monkey gets loose, doesn't he? When I see he's a white guy, naturally, I don't think he's that fast. Naturally, I don't think he's physical. That's just my perception of, you know, that's how we are. I'd uh, make an interception or I'd knock a pass down in front of a guy. Even my own guys would, I'd hear them say, you know, that white boy's eating your lunch out there, you know, can you believe that? And so this is an ideology that had the power in, um, that it was something that not only whites believed, but blacks came to believe it too. As the Miller article talked about, Blacks were seen as having these innate and intrinsic characteristics that allowed them to be physically superior. Um, when it came to dance, that they had some type of natural talent that anthropometry and racial science um, sought out to figure out to identify the gene or the trait or the organ that led to them being athletically superior. And of course, they couldn't find anything. But at the same time, um, they were seen as too dumb to do anything more than something that required physicality. And the thinking activities, um, the things that took technicality um, and, and stuff like that, were reserved for whites. And it was seen that athleticism was essential then to um, the Negro race. And of course this was a myth, but we get various theories that arose to try to explain um, why black people are seen as doing better in sports than white people. The first one is anatomical advantages deriving from anthropometry. The idea that there's a causal link between some body part, some trait, some organ, and athleticism. That there's something about the black body that does not exist in the white body as they understood this binary, that allows the black body to be physically superior. Another theory was that physicality was compensation for intellectual inferiority. The idea that God or nature or something gave black people physical superiority as compensation for not having the advanced mental traits that white, did, white people did. Another theory is the Middle Passage theory, and this was a theory that said um, that the reason that blacks in America are so um, physically sound is that only the most physically sound Africans survived, first of all, um, the Middle Passage, which was when slave ships took Africans and distributed them to the Americas. And only about one-third of the people on the ship actually survived to the Americas. And they thought that those must be the most physically superior third that survived. And therefore, uh, we have a sample of physical Africans. And then in slavery, um, where a lot of Africans were beaten and whipped and killed, it said that only the ones that could withstand that were the ones that survived. Now, as we know, this is not true at all. None of these theories are true, obviously. Um, there's more, and they get even more kind of grotesque and insane. One was the theory of the primordial past, that the speed of African Americans um, was an adaptation from generations of running away from lions and tigers and the African safari, and then running away from slave owners and slave capturers in America, that that's where they derived their speed from. Uh, the Curse of Ham was another one that was espoused by um, a lot of theologians. And it said that blacks were the descendants of Ham, um, whose bloodline God cursed for eternity. This goes back to um, a story in the Bible where um, I believe Ham and his two brothers um, were sons of Noah from Noah's Ark. And... 
it's kind of a weird story, so I apologize if I mess it up. Um, but apparently one day Noah was naked, um, and one of Ham's brothers saw him naked and covered him up and gave him dignity. Another one of his brothers um, covered him up and kind of gave him something to eat and made sure nobody saw him. Again, acted with, with dignity. And then Ham, when he saw him naked, um, well, there, there, there's different interpretations. Um, some people interpret that um, he had sexual relations with his father. Some say that he laughed at him. Um, some say that he merely just didn't cover him up. Um, but regardless, he did something um, that did not restore dignity to a naked and drunk Noah. And because of that, God cursed all of Ham's descendants for eternity. And Ham in the Bible, I guess, was described with characteristics that um, nowadays fit the description of people of African descent. And so a lot of theologians believed that um, Africans are inferior because of God's curse. Lastly, um, there was the relaxation theory, um, thesis, and basically it said that blacks could perform better athletically um, because they weren't cursed with the burden of thinking, that they didn't have the, the rational thinking mind like the white man, and because the white man was so smart, he had things such as stress and anxiety and nervousness that allowed him to not perform as well as the free-thinking black who could just go out there and perform athletically without having to think. So, of course, there were hundreds, probably thousands more theories, but these were some of the most influential ones. And, of course, they're all BS. And some of them would be laughable if they weren't so destructive. And so as we see um, from Hoberman, who wrote a book about um, black athletes um, and kind of how they've been influenced by these racial theories. He said that the scientific search for the racial secrets of the elite athletic black performers is thus inseparable from the legacy of racial folklore, which has always viewed the African as the biological as well as the cultural opposite of the white European. So all these theories, whether they're biological, environmental, cultural, None of them um, escaped these pre-existing racial ideologies that existed at the time in which these scientists were trying to theorize why white people were superior and black people were inferior. Okay, so hopefully um, I've convinced you that race as we biologically understand, race as we understand today is not biological and is not explanatory for any of the differentials that we see today. But it does beg the question, though, because if you watch the NBA, um, it's about 80% black in a country that's about 13% black. If you look at football, it's about 60% black. So if biology does not explain racial differentiation and athleticism, how do we explain the proliferation of black athletes in sports such as basketball and football? And of course, some people would say, and people have said for a while, that it's because blacks are naturally gifted athletes, and that's why it's easier for them to um, make those leagues. But rather than a biologically determinist view, a lot of people and scholars today have turned to a sociocultural view um, that says it's social and cultural factors um, that are responsible for uh, racial differentials in certain sports. And it includes factors such as historical access and exclusion. So black people, as we know in America, um, have been disproportionately poor and grown up in, in poverty and ghettos. And basketball is a relatively inexpensive sport to take up. All you need is a hoop, and a ball, and you don't even need friends, but you can go out there 
and shoot, right? And as we know, every hood has a hoop with um, some sort of chain net or something. But anywhere, you can always find a hoop, right? And so therefore, basketball um, was accessible. But as we know, there's not no ice hockey rinks in the hood, right? There's no tennis clubs or golf courses in a lot of the areas that blacks have historically grown up in. And therefore, we don't see blacks in any of those sports, right? Also, because they're extremely expensive to play. And that leads to the economic viability of sports. A lot of the sports that um, growing up take a lot of money to play are disproportionately white. So ice hockey, like I said, tennis, like I said, golf, um, a lot of these different sports that take money are disproportionately white. And also, there's certain sports that some cultures just prefer to other sports. So growing up um, African-American, basketball is something that's more culturally resonant than many other sports, just like football is something that's um, culturally resonant. So there's this feedback loop that you um, look to professional sports, specifically basketball and football, and those are two of the only places that you see people that look like you. Of course, you're going to pay attention to that more, want to play that more, and therefore will practice and become good at that. Hopefully, right? Because a lot of people, um, black people, aren't athletic and aren't good at football and basketball. Shockingly to a lot of people, I know. But also regional differences, right? It plays upon um, these cultural differences. So in America, basketball and football are two of um, kind of the prime time sports. Whereas in Africa, um, distance running is a culturally resonant sport. Just like um, in Asia, um, specifically China, um, wushu, karate is a culturally resonant sport. Um, ping pong, all these different sports that um, cultures are more prone to playing, you see those cultures being better at, etc., right? There's um, a lot of different explanations. And so by attributing um, black athletic success to natural physical traits, a lot of these attributions deny the presence of character, discipline, hard work, and intelligence. Going back to that um, Key and Peele quote, we see a lot of... Um, commentators today or just random people talk about black athletes and the adjectives that they use are natural talent, um, freaks of nature, athletic, things like that. Whereas when white athletes are described, it's things such as hard work, character, first one in the gym, last one out, things like that, that basically implies that the reason for white success is hard work and talent and mental toughness, whereas blacks can just roll out of bed and perform because they're naturally preordained to. It's ideologies that still exist today. And it denies the fact that African Americans work hard too. African Americans have mental discipline in sports and they've had to train their entire lives for sports, just like white people are athletic. Right? White people can jump, white people can run. So in sports, we get a mixture um, where athleticism and hard work are definitely both part of the equation. Nonetheless, this has structured African-American experiences, as we've talked about in things like stacking, where because of these racial ideologies, we see black people being excluded from thinking positions such as quarterback or catcher. Um, black people being excluded from coaching, and all these other roles of authority that um, the ideology that black people are mentally inferior, inferior has bred. So I want to ask, what are some of the long residuals of these scientifically, um, this myth of race and racial difference, and specifically black physicality, and is it still prevalent today? Is it something that we still hear um, or not? Or has it shifted in some way? Has it changed, right? I know 
one of the big things that we hear, or that at least I heard growing up, was that black people are better at sports because they have an extra muscle in their leg. And I know growing up mixed, half black, half white, I kept wondering, okay, I wonder which leg is my extra muscle in, and when is it going to give me an advantage in sport? And of course, it never did. But I want you to ask, um, how is this racial difference reproduced today? Is it the same? Is it different? Is it coming back? Has it even gone away? And then a little bit of a deeper and more uncomfortable question I want you to ask yourself. So we have black people in um, football and basketball. And it's clear that looking at American society, um, football and basketball are some of the sports in which, or, or some of the popular cultural places in which you see black people more than anywhere else. And so I want you to ask, does modern day sport or the fact that sports the institution in which blacks have high visibility, if not more visibility than any other institution, does that in any way reaffirm or reproduce the harmful beliefs of black physicality for both black America and white America? That's a question I want you to interpret and think about. I want to end with this video. There's nothing genetic about being good at sports. Take it from me. Black people are overwhelmingly non-athletic. In fact, most human beings are non-athletic. But if being an athlete was the only career available to white people, the NBA would look like a Kenny fucking Chesney concert.